The world's oldest profession is prophesizing the end of the world. Every time we had something new, guess what? Radio waves are going to kill us. The big question of progress is how much does technological and industrial progress translate to human progress? The 20th century served up some very hard lessons. In particular, the world wars. We also had a depression. We had the rise of totalitarianism. Maybe actually progress was a mistake. And yet, obviously, we have had amazing progress. If you're alive right now, you've won the cosmic lottery. The clothes that you wear, the breakfast you ate this morning, the fact that you were able to take a hot shower, then hop on a train or get in a car and take the elevator up to the 40th floor and sit behind a plate glass window in an air conditioned room while you type on a computer. All of this is a gift from our ancestors that we just that we just take for granted. And we've completely forgotten about all of the problems that have just been erased from history. We didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. We left the Stone Age because we made some progress. Let's be very realistic about the problems we face. Let's acknowledge them. And yet at the same time, let's try to continue to believe in our agency to go find solutions. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with yet another Infinite Loops. I am the luckiest guy in the world because I get the coolest guests who can have great conversations about things I'm interested in. Uh -huh. Hopefully you're interested in them, too. I think if you're listening, you probably are. Today, I've got Jason Crawford, the founder and president of Roots of Progress which is a nonprofit institute trying to establish a new philosophy of progress for the 21st century. Jason, welcome. First off, there are dozens of us who are in favor of progress. Dozens. <laughs> that, leads, <laughs> that leads to my first question. Why, why do we need all of these various institutions dedicated to something that you would think you, the the mass of humanity would be in favor of. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. Um, first off, great to be here. Um, you uh, so you just asked a question that I have like a fifteen minute answer for. Let me give you the the capsule summary, and we can dive in. You know, wherever you want. Um, yeah, you might think, okay, progress. Well, that's almost tautologically good, right? Um, I think the uh, you know the thing is that progress in our capabilities in our technology and, and industry and you know economic growth and so forth doesn't automatically mean progress in the outcomes that we care about for humanity, you know, human well-being. And so the big question of progress is, um, well, how much do uh, does progress in capabilities actually lead to better outcomes? Um, how much does does um, technological and industrial progress translate to you know, human progress? Now, my capsule sort of of summary of, of, you know, the answer of like, why is it that this is such a controversial thing is, well, you know, at the opening of the 20th century, let's say this was um, not too controversial. Um, the, you know, 1900 or so was a very optimistic time um, because of, you know, really how much had been accomplished in, in even just the preceding few decades. Um, and many people were extremely optimistic about um, technology and the progress of, of science, and um, even they believed the progress of morality and society, and they saw all those things as going together. And in short, um, the 20th century served up some very hard lessons and shattered some very naive illusions, um, in particular the world wars. Uh, you know, but we also had a depression. We had the rise of totalitarianism around the world. Um, there were a lot of other, you know, concerns that people, you know, things were st people were starting to get worried about, like, um, uh, you know, chemicals and um, uh, problems with the environment and and so forth. Um, uh, and uh, you know, short story is that in the 20th century, people started to really question the very idea of progress. And in particular, there was a kind of reactionary movement that arose around the 60s and 70s. Um, that started saying, you know, maybe, um, maybe actually progress was a mistake and, um, or, or maybe, maybe modernity, you know, in kind of the form that we, that we chose to pursue it was, was, was a mistake. Maybe progress is the problem. Maybe we should do a little less of it or do it in a different, in a very different way. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we've never resolved that. And so today, even though in many ways, you know, people are, um, uh, excited about progress or, or in favor of it, let's say, I think they, um, uh, or I can't quite get excited about it, um, many people, because there's still a lot of fear and skepticism and uncertainty and doubt 
around the very idea of progress and around whether you know all of this progress is heading in a in you know to a place that we really want. So, lots to unpack there. Um, first off, I think kind of like I I joke that um, the uh, prostitution is actually the world's second oldest profession. The world's oldest profession is uh, uh, prophesizing the end of the world. So this uh -huh. is to have been part of our human uh, OS and our system and culture for, forever and ever and ever, right? So yeah, you're right about the 60s and 70s and the reactions to sort of specific things that were kind of looked at as progress, yeah. But the unintended consequences were what they were getting really upset about. But, you know, Rousseau um, had, uh, he, he built his entire career around it. Wordsworth has a, a great poem called The World is Too Much With Us. You know, the world is too much with us late and soon, getting and spending. We lay waste our powers, little we see in nature that is ours, right? And so... One can, if you want to go back historically and put things into context, and of course we have Mr. Ludd, who came and, and saw these looming machines and got pissed off, and uh, a movement was born called the Luddites, uh, which literally, you know, took weapons in hand and destroyed their technology of their era. Is, is, so is there some uh, underlying thing? Is there some part of hum the human condition that rebels against what others like me and you might call progress. They don't look at it that way at all. Yeah, certainly. I mean, so controversy about progress is, I mean, I think you're pointing out has really, has always been around. In fact, I mean, the idea of progress is more the exception rather than the rule in history. It's a relatively modern phenomenon. For most of history, you know, people believed in um, either a sort of cyclic view of history, that it's all just ups and downs, um, or even a declinist narrative where the past was a golden age from which we have fallen, you know, and perhaps will continue to fall. And it was really only in uh, the modern era, by which I mean, you know, like, you know, 15, 1600s on, that we even really had anything like the modern idea of progress. Um, and a lot of that comes from Francis Bacon and his contemporaries who, you know, who talked about this. I mean, Bacon in particular, um, uh, you know, pointed out some of the, um, some of the instances of progress that had come around in his day or in, you know, in, in, in recent, um, uh, decades, uh, the, all of the exploration that we were doing throughout the world and the new continents that were getting discovered inventions like, uh, you know, the printing press, um, the compass, gunpowder, um, silk, and, uh, you know, Bacon pointed out, Hey, th there's, there's all this stuff that has just recently been discovered. How much more like this is out there? And he had a whole, uh, you know, program of let's go study the world. Let's do it better. Let's do science better than we've been doing it. And let's ultimately apply this to, um, you know, let's find useful knowledge and apply this to the arts, um, and to, and to, and to industry. Um, and that was a program that people followed for the next, you know, a few hundred years. And I mean, in, in a large way, we are still following today. But yes, at the same time, I mean, even before the Industrial Revolution, you had, I mean, you quoted, you you mentioned Rousseau. So Rousseau has this uh, discourse, I think it's Discourse on the Arts and Sciences, it's called 1750, in which he basically says that um, our our morals and our, our character has been degraded and our, our overall sort of human situation has has been degraded in proportion as our arts and sciences have advanced. And he thought the best societies were those that were least touched by learning um, and uh, and by and by science and by um, you know all these things that we would call advances and progress. And of course, he ha he hadn't seen anything yet, um, right? I mean, the 1750 is really before the Industrial Revolution, and here he's already you know very much against even just um, what you know relatively comparatively uh, comparatively little. Uh, you know, science and arts and so forth there was in his day. So this has always been around, certainly. Um, in the 1800s, I mean, you had Mary Shelley writes Frankenstein, which is this deeply, you know, pessimistic view of what uh, science can do. It, it creates a man and he turns out to be a monster and he's, and he's uncontrollable and he, and he, you know, and he kills. And um, uh, there's one, uh, one that's on my reading list is, um, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Erewhon by Samuel Butler, 
So mm. Butler is the Butler after whom the Butlerian Jihad is uh, is named because Butler had this. Uh, hey, well, I mean, he wrote a number of things. One of the he wrote an essay called Darwin Among the Machines, um, where he talks about in eighteen sixty something. I think he's talking about the inevitability that these machines will eventually, uh, you know, surpass us, replace us, and um, you know, perhaps make us into their slaves. And ends by saying. We just have to smash and destroy them all now, declare war on all of them and just don't let this go any further. Um, you know, and of course, we're, I mean, this this sort of worry uh, persists uh, well into the modern day. I mean, right now, this is exactly kind of the worry about artificial intelligence. Um, so, yeah, these, you know, these ideas um, have been around forever. And I think there's just an, a sort of ebb and flow of which ideas are kind of dominating the conversation, which ideas are popular, which ideas are mainstream, which ideas are influencing policy. Um, it's never that ideas totally go away or that one side is, you know, is, is completely reduced to zero. But if you look at what was happening in the late 19th century... There was so much amazing stuff going on, so many inventions, the light bulb, the, um, you know, the, the internal combustion engine, um, so, you know, the automobile in the early 20th century, the airplane, all sorts of stuff in chemistry, um, uh, you know, the entire electrical industry, the telephone, um, in early 20th century, we got radio, um, there was just, uh, you know, just an enormous amount of stuff going on, not to mention, um, you know, the germ theory, which was, uh, you know, create, starting to, um, even in the late 19th and early 20th century, create um, some real benefits in terms of public health, um, better water sanitation, new vaccines, food handling, all kinds of things. All of this stuff was going on. And I think it was, um, I mean, it was progress was so apparent to people. It was so clear that so much good was being done. And, um, uh, and the and that and that was making people's lives better, and it was giving them all sorts of amazing new inventions, literally coming into their homes with light bulbs and the refrigerator and the washing machine and and you know all sorts of things like that. Um, that I think the conversation, you know, again, people were just super optimistic, and I mean, frankly, in some ways, naively optimistic. They thought that um, all of this technological improvement would go hand in hand with moral and social improvement, and even that we were on a path to world peace because of the increase of trade and uh, and the growth of the economy and better communication uh, technology like the telegraph and so forth. Um, and of course, the 20th century did not bring world peace. It brought world war. Um, and so that, again, that was part of this sort of shattering of the illusion. I think the world wars in particular dealt a blow to the optimists. And it was a staggering blow from which they had a lot of difficulty recovering. And so it really brought a lot of much more fatalistic and and defeatist thinking to the fore. Um, as early as the 1930s, so even before World War II, but just after World War I and, you know, I guess depression and, and starting to see the rise of totalitarianism, you have historians like Karl Becker um, writing about progress and saying that the idea of progress has been uh, discredited and the doctrine has been refuted. And, uh, you know, and he's kind of plaintively asking, what's left? What can we say on behalf of the human race? You know, may we still, in whatever different fashion, believe in the progress of mankind. That's, uh, that's something he wrote in a, in a lecture in the 1930s. So, um, so I think that was really, uh, you know, that was, was really what happened. This kind of, there's this shifting tide um, of people feeling better or worse about progress um, that, that sort of goes back and forth, both in, in, in response to events and also, you know, historical events, but also, crucially, in response to people's interpretation of those events. And so it's a combination of the history and also which commentators, which historians and philosophers and, and journalists and other intellectuals sort of step forward to explain and to interpret that history. And what's the, you know, what do they say about it? What, what sense do they make of it? What meaning do they give to it? So I think that's what we saw in the 20th century. Wow. And, you know, just to uh, comment on a few things you touched on, uh, Rousseau, uh, if, if you haven't read Rousseau, listeners and viewers, give him a whirl, because um, as you point out, uh, Rousseau, maybe if born in another time, I could see him as the head of a Taliban unit somewhere, right? <laughs> because uh, he, he, he was pretty hardcore uh, in his... Uh, anger uh, about uh, what we call progress, et cetera. And uh, that's very interesting. Uh, Shelley's Frankenstein, I have a slightly different take on it, 
Uh, hmm. Yes, it was incredibly pessimistic, but it was one of the first novels to say that man could create life, didn't need the gods. And if you look historically at stories, human stories... The, the subtitle, of course, is The Modern Prometheus. Yes, of course. I know. Uh, but th that's, the, uh, that's the element of um, uh, the book that I was interested in, right? So kind of like pessimistic, yeah. yes, but look, we are Prometheans and look at what we can do now. Um, Bacon, uh, you, you're hitting on like all of my favorite people. Uh, the O'Shaughnessy Fellowships were originally going to be called the Atlantean Fellowships because I took my inspiration from Bacon's uh, utopia, utopia novel on Atlantis and how they sent 12 investigators out into the world to see uh, what, uh, well, well, what's cooking out there. We, we need to stay uh, uh, on top of this. Um, and so the, um, the idea also seems to me to be really, you, you need to look at evolution and the ev evolution of human psychology to understand why this sort of precautionary principle uh, it, and pessimism are far more appealing to what I call, you know, shrink wrapped human OS, human operating system. Uh, you know, I believe that our operating system is emotionally governed, and I believe that the emotion that governs all the others is fear, specifically fear of the unknown. And that makes sense if you're a hunter gatherer living in a very unprogressed <laughs> world, because the world was a very, very dangerous place for most humans. Um, and, and we are living in a vastly safer world because of progress and innovation. Um, but, you know, every every innovation that you mentioned, right, there's a great website called uh, PessimistArchive.org, and it goes all the way back uh, through history and shows the actual writing of the time. And every time we had something new, guess what? The, the um, end of the world types came out and, you know, radio, it's a bunch of newspaper articles about how radio waves are going to kill us. And they, they were always done with a shot of dead birds around a radio tire, uh, tower. And, and so it seems to me that pessimism is easy, really easy, because it, it you know, it is, comports with our operating system, so to speak, governed by fear. Um. And, and yet, obviously, we, we have had amazing progress. We are like, I, I always say that if you're alive right now, you are, you've won the cosmic lottery. You live at the safest, safest, best time for humans ever in history. And yet it, it, it went wrong. Right. And, and it's gotten to the point where you have an entire institute devoted to doing a rebranding of progress. So talk to me a little bit about your the ideas around which you think we'll get a better foothold and get people to like go, oh yeah, didn't think about that. Maybe we should be more open to all this progress. Yeah. Um let me just comment briefly on kind of the safety, you know, issue that you raised. Um, you know, as you point out, and you can see in the pessimist archive, people have always been worried about the safety of new technologies. This is true even in an era when, uh, you know, even in times and places where people generally were very positive about progress and are very excited about the future, any specific thing that came along, they would get worried about and somebody would push back on and somebody would try to ban it or regulate it or, um, you know, put some kind of, you know, kind of hobble on it. So, um, yeah, so, so people have always been worried about, um, you know, specific new things that come along. Um, they're often, they're not worried about the they turn out not to be worried about the thing that's actually dangerous, right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of worries about okay, maybe radio waves, you know, a radio wave is going to kill us, right? But um, there was also there's also a lot of uh, you know when when X rays were actually um created, people were super uh you know cavalier with them for a long, for for well, it only took a few years for them to figure out, uh oh, this is really hurting people and maybe killing people. 
Um, but in that time, you know, a lot of a lot of damage was done because uh, people would just use it very casually, even at parties, and you know, as kind of a novelty. Hey, X-ray your hand. Look, you can see your skeleton. We, you know, um, didn't realize you're maybe giving yourself cancer or something. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, the actual risks can be very hard to um, predict. Um, but I think that so 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 here's the paradox. The level of safety that we have achieved, and I mean, the reduction in mortality rates, the reduction in disease, reduction in accidents, vehicle fatalities, all this stuff is one of the great achievements of progress. It's one of the triumphs of, uh, you know, of science and technology. Um, and yet at the same time, I think what's happened is as the sort of baseline mortality rate decreases, and as we, especially as we decrease like infant and child mortality, so now pretty much everybody can expect to live you know, a, a, a decent, you know, full life. Um, not so many people just killed, killed right off before they even reach adulthood. Now there's kind of a, a, a background expectation of safety and every new thing that comes along now, I think has to meet that, you know, sort of burden of safety. So I think people were actually, I think people are more concerned about new technologies now in part for a good reason, which is that we've already made the world so safe that we don't want to introduce, you know, I mean, in a world where, uh, you know, you could accidentally, you know, get typhoid fever one day and be dead a week later. And that could, this could happen to anybody at almost any time. If you say, okay, and now I'm introducing an automobile and you could maybe be in an accident and be dead, you know, the next day, like, well, that was just one more thing that might kill you tomorrow in a background world of lots of things that might kill you tomorrow, right? And now we have so few things that might kill you like tomorrow um, that if you, that, that to introduce a, you know, a new one, I mean, is a very high standard, right? So now when we're introducing like self-driving cars, those are held to a much higher standard than the original cars were, right? In terms of, in terms of safety, how much testing we're doing on them, how much we make sure they're, they're safe before we introduce them. And so, you know, I think part, in, in part, we've gone overboard with a safety mindset, but I also think part of it is, is an, is a sort of rational react, to um to changing circumstances um and the, so you would ask me a question about then uh but maybe i'll give you a chance to react to that if you want yeah no uh thank you um i <laughs> you're absolutely right about safety and we're safest now and and maybe that's a motivating factor to put the bar higher and higher and higher on safety um because you know if you know the history of innovation for example, if, if we had today's attitudes when electricity was being broadly adopted, it would have been shut down because electricity was really fucking dangerous and it burned things down and there was people getting killed by touching it without knowing and all of those things. So from the point of view of a rational optimist in the Deutschian sense, right, I, I, I am rational about the things that can go wrong. In, th in fact, I anticipate much will go wrong yeah. as we make progress. That's part and parcel to making progress, right? And, and so, you know, we invented fire or discovered fire, better way. Prometheus brought us fire and was punished severely uh, for it. But, um, you know, so we discover fire. Awesome. Creates the prefrontal cortex of the modern Homo sapiens sapien, right? Without cooked food, we couldn't have this prefrontal, this glorious prefrontal cortex, which allows for a lot of progress, interestingly enough. But fire can also be incredibly dangerous. You know, you can burn down entire villages, or if you want to be funny about it, George Carlin often quipped he goes you know i wonder about the first person who wanted to invent a flamethrower right it's like you know i want to set those people over there on fire but they're too far away i wonder what i could invent to make that happen right but but okay so fire very dangerous very beneficial right we also afterwards created fire alarms fire departments fire men and women fire safety fire exits we mitigated as best we could many of the problems that came along with the incredible good use of fire. Say, most importantly, we stopped building entire cities out of wood. Out of wood. <laughs> right. Exactly. And that's a secondary effect of, you know what? This great fire of London that Samuel Papes uh, wrote so eloquently about, uh, maybe we shouldn't be building things out of wood. Right? But, but so... Back to back to the original 
uh, thought, how, how would you, well, you're doing it. So please tell me, what are you focusing on highlighting to try to bring a reasonable debate? Because I'm also in favor, by the way, of discussion. Um, you know, what, what we see, ha- well, we'll talk about AI, I think, probably extensively. As you know, I'm involved with Stability AI as an investor, and I'm chairman of the board, big believer in uh, what AI can do for humanity. Uh, doesn't mean I don't see the problems. There will be problems. And, and so I think, maybe I'm naive and idealistic here, but I think that, uh, you know, sunlight is the best disinfected and that, that that having a good conversation from both sides is not only needed, it, it's necessary, right? But what happens, of course, is what has already happened, right? You, you, you have the, the um, uh, Unabomber. The, over here, right? And, and we won't name the, the class, but there's a lot of really smart people who are making outrageous statements about what should, you mentioned the the uh, the uh, but, Butlerian jihad, right? Which Dune made very famous, um, and you know they're basically calling for that. And then you have the people over here saying, no, everything is going to be great with, with AI and it's perfect. And it's really, it's perfect. I think obviously they're, they're confusing possibilities and probabilities, right? And when you stake out these extreme parts of the argument, it, it makes it very difficult to have a good progress making conversation about it. That's part of your aim. So tell me a bit about what you're hoping to achieve with the Institute. Yeah. Um, The mission of my nonprofit, The Roots of Progress, is to establish a new philosophy of progress for the 21st century. And um, I think you do that in a few ways. Um, One, by sort of actually creating the intellectual foundations of that movement, the ideas that it's going to be based on. Um, two, by building a community around those ideas. And then three, by um, sort of getting the ideas out to a broader um, sort of mass audience through education and journalism and, um, you know, art and entertainment and so forth. Um, but the foundation of it all really is that that the first thing I mentioned, which is the, you know, the, the ideas. Um, and so I think there are, uh, there are uh, a few different areas where we really need a lot more intellectual work. Um, one is the history of progress. Uh, and sort of, I, I think the, one of the biggest reasons why people can be so ambivalent about progress at best or hostile to it at worst is um, just not having this really deep and keen sense of how much progress has been made, of how much worse life used to be. Um we're in this situation where it's just so easy to take all of the progress of the modern world for granted. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the clothes that you wear, the, you know, the, the breakfast you ate this morning, the, the mattress you woke up on with a, you know, a nice foam mattress or inner spring mattress, the, the fact that you were able to take a hot shower, you know, in the morning and then hop on a train or a, or a work to, to, to work or, or get in a car and take the elevator up the 40th floor and sit behind a plate glass window in an air conditioned room while you type on a computer to earn your living, uh, you know, and then get home in the evening to, to relax with streaming music or movies. I mean, all of this is a gift from our ancestors that we just, that we just take for granted. And we've completely forgotten about, um, all of the problems that our ancestors had to deal with that are, have just been erased from history, you know, epidemics of smallpox or cholera, um, the, uh, you know, the muck of, you know, manure in the city streets, which, you know, at one point was such a problem that people were worried about how our cities were ever going to keep growing because there was, there were so many horses and so much manure on the streets. Um, the, you know, the, if you had a relative, uh, go, uh, travel between, you know, America and Europe, they were on a boat for two months and, you know, they could easily be lost at sea and you wouldn't even hear about it right away. Uh, or, you know, if you had a child and they scraped their finger on a rusty nail, they could die from that, you know, right? Today, now today, we have tetanus shots, but back then. Um, so there are all these things that we just don't even have to worry about. Um, I mean, food security, right? I mean, the the just the incidence of famine 
um, you know, and, and how easy it was for famine to be induced by a drought or a flood or a frost or blight or, you know, pests. Um, so we, we, we take all of this for granted and we are, we're like fish in water with technology. It surrounds us so much that we've just, it recedes into the background and we forget about it. And so I think that the number one most basic thing that needs to be done is just to tell this story and to, and to popularize it, to just remind people of how far we've come, of how much progress we've actually made, of how much worse the past um, really was and how how great we have it today in in so many ways and i think that needs to begin in 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 school i mean i think really in in, in high school there ought to be you know courses on this stuff and in university um so that's so that's number one is the history um i think another thing that we need in terms of intellectual work is uh actually attacking the problems uh, especially the ones that arose in the 20th century that made people really question the idea of progress um uh, we we can't uh, deny those problems or dismiss them or try to shove them under the rug, right? They're real. There are a lot of very real problems around progress. Safety is an issue. Um, uh, the misuse of technology, uh, the evil uses of technology for war and oppression, social upheaval, technological unemployment, um, uh, pollution, uh, health hazards, all of these things are real. Um, what we need is not to be sort of fatalistic and defeatist about them, but to be uh, you know, more solutionist to acknowledge the problems, but then look for ways to move forward, usually with, uh, you know, by solving the problems of progress with more progress, which is how we've solved most of the problems of progress throughout most of history. And so I think we need, um, you know, people kind of looking at all the problems of the modern world, everything that's been blamed on progress, um, and looking at, yeah, okay, let's take this problem seriously. And how do we actually solve it? Um, and then the last kind of area I'll call out is, uh, a positive vision of the future, something constructive. What's the future that we are, are excited to create? What's a future that we really want to live in? Um, right now, I think, you know, bold, ambitious visions of the future have mostly been lost. You know, our society once dreamed of moon bases and flying cars. And today, I feel like the best that kind of the most optimistic vision that you get out of anybody in the mainstream is uh, one where we manage to avoid disaster, one where we stop climate change prevent pandemics, you know, maybe alleviate a little bit of extreme poverty. Uh, but, you know, the notion that we could uh, return to space or have fusion energy or nanotech manufacturing or, you know, all of this stuff uh, just feels to too many people like a kind of very abstract sci-fi, you know, fantasy. Wow, Jason, that's great. And I, I want to pick up on the your last comment there, the sci-fi fantasy. So, so I think you know, if you also look at science fiction uh, from the year 1900, which you cited earlier, you know, you've got H.G. Wells, you've got a lot of writers who are incredibly optimistic in their science fiction, right? For, for people who don't want to go all the way back to Wells in the time machine, think Star Trek in its original uh, uh, series uh, of the late 1960s, I believe. A uh, very, very optimistic view of the future. And then, of course, we got the Terminator, Mad Max, um, et al., right? And, you know, listen, I, I love some of those movies, too. Uh, they, they're they dramatic and they're fun, but they they persistently and consistently preach dystopia um, as as the result of progress. And so one of the things that we're doing at O'Shaughnessy Ventures in our infinite media division is we had a contest, uh, you know, the Netflix popular series Black Mirror, right? Um, we said, well, I wonder if there's anyone writing White Mirror stories. And the winner actually is writing an entire book about it. And we're exploring making movies of those science fiction stories that he's writing. So we completely agree on the idea of telling better stories and getting people more excited. Um, I also love your idea uh, of something that I guess I have a blind spot on because I love history so much. A and that is that, you know, there's maybe a big segment of society that really doesn't know about how shitty, literally shitty cities were when we had horses everywhere. And what they smelled like and, and the, the, the shit <laughs> people had to literally wade through 
to go about their day. Um, and, and so I think that that is great too. And if we can tell both the historical story, um, better through, uh, you know, stories, through movies, through conversations, et cetera, I think that's great. Um, and then tell the idea or have writers, creators coming up with white mirror type stories as opposed to black mirror. I think that that's very, very helpful. Um, but I, but I also wonder, um, you know, how do we make like progress cool? How, how do we make the vibe of progress like something cool kids want to be espousing, right? Because I'm not Panglossian in my outlook at all. I, I'm, v I'm very aware and cognizant of the fact that with progress come problems. And we have to be cognizant of that. We have to be aware of that. We have to address those problems. You know, Bucket, uh, Beckett's uh, try again, fail again, uh, try again, fail better. You know, I, I'm doing, I'm butchering his quote. But the, the idea of iteration, the idea of uh, understanding that um, we have to be solutions based. I love that aspect of what you're talking about. Um, talk. Talk to me a little bit more about that. How 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 do you make this cool? Because like everything's a vibe, right? And uh, how do we make, especially young people today, like really, really uh, enamored of and desirous of pushing progress? I actually think in regards to progress being cool, my impression is actually that we're kind of a bit of a better position there than we were maybe a few decades ago um you know in particular so i mean before i got into writing about progress i was in uh, the tech industry and my background's in computer science and um you know there was a time when when people into computers were just the geeks right <laughs> um and, you know <laughs> and then somebody um what was the uh i think there was a documentary or something somebody somebody did a a a, a film or a, or a book or something called revenge of the nerds yeah and it was a right it was about how oh well who you know who kind of took over the world it was like bill gates yeah. and uh you know and jobs and wozniak and all these guys who um had just been the computer geeks and it turned out they became some of the most you know kind of wealthy and 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 powerful and influential people in society um, you know, and, and today you'd add Zuckerberg and a bunch of other folks. So, um, uh, and, and today we've got Elon Musk, right? Um, so I feel like, I feel like maybe the, um, I'm not sure if progress is uncool. I do think that, um, having more positive and specific visions of the future would definitely help motivate people. Right. I think, um, I think we need, uh, I think we need something beyond just cure disease and maybe stop climate change and so forth. I mean, those are good goals, but I think we do need a, um, you know, a positive idea of, of the kind of the amazing stuff. And it sounds like sci-fi. Um, and, and, and it really does. And it's hard to talk about, you know, something like the potential for nanotech without sounding a little bit like you've just been reading too much sci-fi. Um, but the fact is that, and this comes back to the history, sci-fi has come true. Our entire world today would look like sci-fi to someone from 100 or 200 years ago, and so um, you know, sci-fi actually happens, and um, and and it does change the world in in these crazy ways. Um, I think, I mean, my hunch is that it's less about is does progress seem cool, and maybe more about um, does it seem uh, does it seem moral, does it seem um, you know, like something that's actually doing good for humanity does, you know, uh, so, so there's kind of a combination of one, do we even have a, a, a kind of a specific, um, thing that people might get excited about? Um, and that's the, that's the futurism aspect, right? And then the other is, you know, but what about people who feel like, um, well, to do good for the world, uh, I need to, I need to not go join these tech companies because they're actually busy destroying the world. And I need to maybe join the efforts that are stopping the tech companies, or I need to, you know, do something else entirely. Right. Um, I think that's the, I think we need to, to funnel pe not only people's kind of cool energy, but also their moral energy, you know, towards, um, uh, t towards making progress. And so one of the things that I would, 
you know, one of the deepest changes that I would like to see in society is coming to think of scientists and inventors and entrepreneurs as a moral archetype, as actually a sort of, you know, a view of kind of the creator as a certain type of hero. And th that life of creation and invention and discovery and building as actually a, uh, a noble quest to pursue. Wow. I love that idea. Um, you know, uh, and as I was listening to you, I was thinking of E.O. Wilson's, you know, we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technologies. As, yes. Oh, that's not the best mix in the world. <laughs> um, but I, I love the idea of the creator as hero. Um, and, uh, you know, Steve Jobs, like he made tech super cool, right? Yeah. And 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 so I think that's a, a a a great story in and of itself. I I wonder though about m using morality as our lens to look through, though, because like that that is isn't that kind of the third why or third line of the rail that you're not supposed to touch because that's where all the electricity is because. Obviously, people have very, very different views of what is and what is not moral. And, you know, that could be sorted by one, the religion one adheres to, the society one is brought up in. Um, you know, Eastern societies are much more group oriented versus Western societies, which are much more individualistically uh, oriented. Um, so t talk to me a little bit about when you're using the term moral framework what exactly do you mean yeah so you know we don't all have to uh, agree on every aspects of a whole code of morality or religion or whatever in order to um in order to solve this problem or to make progress um but i do think that if there's a um if there's a dominant view that kind of technology and industry are essentially uh you know destroying society then those things will be seen as immoral activities. And, um, and I think if, if people see it in that way, then um, we're going to get a lot less of technology and industry, right? So it's just kind of at that s simple, very basic level. Um, you know, maybe we don't all have to agree that this is like some sort of moral ideal, but, um, but definitely I think we at, least, uh, we at least need some clarity on you know, is, is, is technology and industry destroying the world or is it actually uh, a tool that can make the world a better place? Yeah, that, that's, that is a, a great example. Um, and you know, it's interesting to me because on the one hand, you've written extensively about how progress requires not only optimism, but agency and the uh, difference between a prescriptive and a descriptive optimism, um, which I, I find absolutely fascinating in your writing. Um, but I completely agree about the need for what I call rational optimism um, and agency. And yet concurrent with that, we see a culture that is increasingly a culture which seeks to reward victimization which seeks to reward um, grievance culture um, and which points the finger elsewhere for all problems. It's not my fault. It's those evil fill in the blank where you happen to be. You're, you're, the, the, the culture is inculcating um, a defenseless victim style mentality while at the same time making it um, uh, giving it a sense of entitlement, right? So a culture that is producing entitled, victimized, non-agenic people, how the hell is that going to fill the needs for, you know, uh, rational optimism with lots of agency? Oh, yes. Come on, give me a harder question. <laughs> um, I never said uh, it would be easy. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, look, um, uh, I, yeah, I don't know how to solve that problem. I sympathize. I think those broader cultural trends are, I mean, I, I, I see that too. 
I haven't, uh, it's not something I feel competent to, to really comment on kind of where does all that come from? What does it mean? But I, 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 I sympathize with this seeing, um, uh, a, a loss of agency, both at the individual level and the social level, right? Feeling like we're not in control of our lives, our destiny or our, or, you know, the future of our society. And, um, I mean, you 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 pension, you you pointed to some of my writings about the term optimism. I tend to I, I tend to try to avoid mostly the term optimism because I think it's uh, it can mean a lot of different things, and it's uh, it can be a little unclear what kind of optimism you're talking about. There's one kind of optimism that basically amounts to complacency, which is the the denial of problems. It's kind of just you know you put on your rose colored glasses, you say the future looks bright, um, there's no problems in our path. Everything's we're on the right track, um, and no no need to worry, right? And um, uh, you know the problem with complacent optimism is it's uh, often not true. There's we're sometimes we're not on the right track. Sometimes the problems are looming and huge. Um, and so what I uh, there was this uh, there, there's a lot of different ways to formulate this. There was there was one that was uh, what pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. Right. Which is the idea that, um, OK, maybe let's let's have a sort of very steely eyed kind of, you know, let's let's be very realistic about the problems we face. Let's acknowledge them. And yet at the same time, let's try to continue to believe in our agency to go find solutions. So I wrote a whole piece on this for um, MIT Technology Review, and I called out what's one of my favorite historical examples which is this guy, William Crookes, Sir William Crookes, who was a famous British physicist and who, at the end of the 19th century, um, called out, made all, this whole big speech, calling out uh, the fact that, frankly, the world was running out of fertilizer and was heading towards a major agricultural crisis. Um, now, you know, and it, this sounds a lot like people... Uh, worrying about sustainability today, right? In fact, one way you could interpret this is to say, you know, he was essentially saying that the the, the world's agricultural system was not sustainable, um, and and in an important sense, it, it was not. We were running out of uh, out of fertilizer. It was true, um, and he had the numbers to prove it and back it up. You know, and people even called him alarmist at the time. And he sort of, you know, and he kind of defended himself against that. He's like, well, you know, so you call me alarmist, but look, I've got the facts here. I, you can just look at the numbers. We're running out of fertilizer. But at the same time, what did he, what, you know, what did he say to do in response? His point in, and his purpose in calling out and calling this out was, um, you know, not like say a modern degrowther to say, well, we need to reduce population, stop eating so much. Um, and, uh, you know, try to do with less, less farmland and less fertilizer and so forth. No, what he said was he called on the chemists of the world to invent synthetic fertilizer. Um, and in his, it's in the same speech where he was calling out this huge problem that we were facing and in really dire language, I mean, he didn't pull his punches. Um, in that same speech, he pointed to ways that we might be able to solve the problem. Uh, and in fact, he had the essence of the solution correct, which was to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere into a form that could be, you know, that, that plants could use it. Um, and now he was, uh, in that speech, he was pointing towards um, uh, a solution that involved electricity, which isn't the way we ended up going. We ended up using what became known as the Haber-Bosch process. Um, but, you know, he had the, the essence of the solution correct. Um, we're going to do it through, we're going to solve this problem through chemistry. We're going to fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere. We're going to make synthetic fertilizer and we're going to, and we're going to be able to keep growing. And that is exactly uh, what happened within, you know, less than two decades after he made that speech. So that to me is the essence of solutionism, right? You might be calling out a very dire problem in stark and even alarmist sounding terms. And yet at the same time, you are, um, you know, you're looking for the best way to move forward with progress and growth. I love that. I love the essay. And uh, I, I, it's a great example because... Uh, you know, we go back to Malthus and they were also saying we we're all going to die of starvation because we couldn't sustain population growth uh, with the then applicable and knowable um, agricultural methods. But Malthus didn't. He was a degrowther, right? He, he didn't he didn't basically say, hey, we got to invent uh, solutions to this. He the, created what they call the Club of Rome, which is sort of like the ultimate pessimist club. And and the idea that we no no to, the only solution here is to not grow anymore and to go backwards. But I, I wonder, 
if, you know, because it, it gets into David Deutsch, one of my heroes, the author of uh, The Beginning of Infinity, which everyone who knows me is tired of listening to me recommend as a book. Um, but he, 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 you, he, it requires the ability to understand that along with new inventions will become, will come new problems, but that we will also be able to solve them. And, and the challenge, uh, on the fertilizer is the great example of that, right? It, here's a problem. It's a real problem. Here's what I suggest as a solution. I think that that's great. Very Deutschian in the idea of like, yeah, there's going to be a lot of problems, but we're going to also be able to solve them. And, but standing in the way of that is the, again, back to human OS, human operating system. You know, Julian Simon wrote a book called The Ultimate Resource, and he was talking about human creativity. And, you know, Deutsch has us as the only universal explainers and um, and people who are able to figure things out, which I agree with. But then you, you know, smack dab in the middle of all of that is this profound, almost inability of the majority of humans to understand that we don't know everything. If, if you if you if you look at many of the arguments that are being made now, y y many of them have planted axioms that we know everything there is to know. And I, I don't know how anyone can espouse that, right? If, if, if you don't even have to know much history to know that we don't what did uh, Ed uh, Edison say we don't know one one thousandth of nothing. Uh, I'm butchering that a little bit, but the idea that we already know everything hobbles, I think, significantly hobbles our ability to understand that we don't, that we cannot prophesize future developments and discoveries. Uh, we have a horrible track record at that. Um, and and so I like your idea of, you know, a solutions-based First off, identify the problem. It's a real problem, but then suggest some solutions, right? We we didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones, right? We we left the Stone Age because we made some progress. Um, and you know, and we continued to make some progress in the ancient world, and then Rome fell, and we had a thousand years of darkness. And then we had, you know, the scientific method, the the Gutenberg. Uh, the beginnings maybe of a human colossus being built. Um, so I, this is a, I'm just going to put it weirdly to you, but do we deserve progress? Do humans deserve progress? I think we deserve as much progress as we can achieve. Certainly. Um, I mean, um, <clears throat> You uh, so you, you you mentioned David Deutsch, a uh, huge fan of Deutsch and his book Beginning of Infinity. It's one of my top recommendations for people interested in the in the idea of progress. Um, and uh, you, one of his key ideas in that book is the notion that progress always creates more problems. Um, we are we've never solved the last problem. Any new solution will create new problems. Hopefully, there are better problems to have. Usually, they are. Um, and uh, and hopefully uh, and, and usually they are problems that we can solve in turn with more progress, which will create more problems and, and so forth. It really never ends. Um, I think once you, uh, you know, one key is to learn to see that as a good thing and to, the, to see the fact that progress always creates new problems, not as an indictment of progress, but simply as the natural order of the universe um, when you stop thinking about things in terms of a static kind of view of the universe where we're trying to reach some end state and then that it's good and we're just going to stay there. But you think more in dynamic terms of we are always on a journey. The journey is never ending. We're always trying to improve. New things are always going to come up. New problems are always going to arise. We'll come up with new solutions. We'll move forward. And that process of, of motion, that dynamic process never ends. You know, then I think you can see, aha, it's not about avoiding the problems. It's about solving them as quickly as possible when they come up and spending as little time with them, you know, as possible and, and making progress uh, as fast as possible. 
So I agree, obviously. Um, but I wonder, uh, as I listen, you know, is this is this discussion is this debate inherently political? Um, and and the reason I ask that is I I, I subscribe a bit to Mencken's view that people who crave power will use scare tactics to um, com compel others to do their bidding, right? I, I personally have no interest in having power over other people. I would love to empower other people. I think that that's the only way we have moved towards a better, more equitable society. But like, unfortunately, the base rate for my attitude there, if we just look historically, ain't so great, right? Because we have, you know, uh, this, this flaw in, in our human nature, protect me, protect me. And it gets back to the, you know, if I was, if I wanted to take over a country, yeah, you know what I would sow? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That's what I would sow. What does our modern media sow every day? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Why do they do it? Because they're maximizing the objective function for revenue, right? And I think, and now I made an AI reference there. I'm a nerd. I'm sorry. Uh, um, but like we can maximize the objective function for human creativity, for human flourishing, for a variety of things. And yet, you know, the, the, the uh, butchering Mencken here, the, the, uh, the impulse to save humanity is almost always a false flag for the impulse and desire to rule humanity, right? So enter politics. I, I've said many times, I'm actually worried that our political system, at least in this country, is so far behind the understanding and the technology and everything. It's like, you know, we make jokes about it. We had the senator... Um, who died in the plane crash, sadly, but you know, he was an old school guy and they were, this was about the internet and, and basically they I can't remember his name. He was the Senator from Alaska, but, uh, essentially you got the, the, the meme, the internet is a series of tubes. <laughs> and, and so we, we have institutions political institutions specifically that have the power to forbid have the power power to ban um you know and and i just wonder that are they so far behind being switched on about what's actually going on that the regulations that look again the reality of the situation is the tech leaders of today are going to what Desire regulation. Why? Regulatory capture. Best way to do that is to get get there first, then tell the lawmakers, ooh, it's really dangerous. You need to have a lot of rules around us, uh, around this, right? And regulatory capture is the rule of the day. I think I saw something, I don't know, uh, recently that, you know, the, the last bill actually written by a Congress critter was like... 25 years ago. They're all written by lobbyists now. They're written by private industry. And and uh, what is there a solution to that? Hopefully, please. <laughs> you keep throwing these really easy questions at me, Jim. I don't know, you know. <laughs> so look, let me start with the big picture. You know, you talk about the kind of maybe the inherent human desire to rule others and, you know, so forth. If not inherent, then maybe a common desire to rule. Um, but, you know, in the big picture, I think we've made a lot of progress. You know, we, I, we talk about progress and progress. We usually talk kind of think about science, technology and industry and economics. Um, but I think we've actually made a lot of progress uh, at a high level in morality, society and governance as well. I agree. So, yeah, you know, the impulse to rule has has always been around. Used to be a lot worse in terms of what it could uh, do um, or, or what it did on average, right? So if you think just a few hundred years ago, right? And so in 1775, the entire world more or less was under monarchy. That was our default system of government. 
Uh, slavery was the rule in, you know, many parts of the world, if not, if not most of the world. Um, you know, of course, women didn't have, uh, you know, many rights in, in a lot of places, if not everywhere, um, uh, et cetera. Right. And you, you can kind of go on. Um, today we have, um, you know, representative democracies, uh, democratic republics that are, you know, that is, that is a model for much of the world, not everywhere. Um, slavery has been officially outlawed everywhere in the world and it survives only in, um, you know, some, some very small places where it's overlooked by the, the government. Um, uh, you know, women have many more rights in, in most places. And, um, so we've, we've come a long way and we have, um, we've really improved that, uh, uh, you know, uh, oppression and, um, I mean, even war, right now, now, you know, we may be in an unstable world that could, that could, you know, plunge into war again, but, um, we've been doing fairly well, you know, in terms of, of war overall for the last several decades. So, um, so I think things have gotten better. And, um, and so I think progress happens in, in politics too, in morality and society. It's much less clear. Um, it's much harder to measure, it feels much less consistent, much more, you know, two steps forward, one step back versus science and technology, which just kind of race ahead. Um, but I think that, but I think it's real. Um, I think one of the, so one of the problems in the U S especially, and maybe more broadly in the world today, when it comes to some of the stuff that, that you're talking about is that, um, when we look at the problems created by progress, we very often uh, adopt a solution that is, in my opinion, more or less micromanagement, right? So what the, so the solution to, um, you know, to, so let's just make this concrete, right? Um, something's going on like, uh, oh, you know, at the turn of the century, last century, it turns out like, oh, a lot of drugs were actually um, uh, just total fraud. And, um, you know, meat handling was in a very bad state and, and milk and like food handling in general. And a lot of food was adulterated. So, okay really bad things going on. Right. Um, or, um, you know, you could look at all sorts of the cities, cities burning down, um, disease spreading, um, uh, whatever those electrical, you know, power lines are dangerous, et cetera, all these kind of problems. But then the, the, the American impulse at least, or through most of the 20th century has been, okay. Um, let's bring in inspectors. Let's set up a regulatory agency. Let's have more oversight. Um, and let's either, put up a whole bunch of really detailed rules that tell people exactly what they have to do, or let's get an inspector, you know, or a regulator in place who will, uh, him, you know, he or she will be the one who will tell everybody kind of exactly what they have to do. Um, and I think this has led to, uh, sort of, you know, governance by micromanagement. <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, coming back to what I said is really needed from the progress movement. Um, I would love to, look back, oh, oh, have, a, have a really comprehensive look back over the 20th century and, and, and beyond and look at all of these problems that arose that we said we need another uh, maybe regulatory agency in response to and just start to think about some alternate ways that, that, uh, that some of those problems could have been solved. Um, uh, there were, uh, again, we can't just be sort of complacent optimists and say like, well, we don't need all of these rules because, you know, everything will be fine without them. Everything was very demonstrably not fine uh, without them. Um, and there are real issues of, um, uh, of safety and of, uh, you know, just all, all kinds of hazards that can be created, um, through, through all kinds of technology and misuse or, or abuse or, or negligence. Um, but I think that we should be, you know, looking for solutions other than let's come up with an enormous number of sort of very nitpicky rules that lock things in place and make it difficult to innovate um, and uh, and that also have this tendency to just sort of grow over time without ever uh, being revised, or at least it's very difficult to revise them, right? Regulation tends to be a ratchet where it kind of goes in one direction. It just ratchets up and it's very hard, um, uh, uh, not totally impossible, but very hard to ever kind of undo it. Yeah, I uh, agree. I uh, serve on the board of a, a group called Common Good here in New York. Uh, Philip Howard has written lots of books about this. And it is the replacement of the judgment, uh, hopefully good, of individual people in power, men or women, 
uh, normally in government or regulatory agencies, um, with rules. And um, it takes the agency away from the individual. For example, the mandatory sen sentencing guidelines for judges are absolutely ridiculous because they hobble the judge from using their common sense and, you know, their ability to weigh the situation of this particular instance, right? If it's three strikes and you go to jail forever and those strikes were really not horrible, but, you know, still counted as strikes, you're, you're sending potentially a very redeemable person to jail for the rest of their lives because that's the rule, right? If you're a fan of Douglas Adams, you know all about the Bogons, right? They're the most bureaucratic race in the galaxy. And everything is done according to rules that are antiquated and usually lead to disaster. Um, but I'm not at all opposed to regulatory oversight. I think it's required, right? In 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 a world, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Upton Sinclair wrote all the books about the what was going on in the food industry and and uh, some really bad things that needed addressing. And I often use my own birth, the year of birth, 1960, as an example of how much America in particular has changed for the better, right? Um, in 1971, a married woman could not get a credit card in her own name if she didn't have a letter signed giving her permission from her husband. How crazy. I mean, just even hearing that, I was 11 years old when that happened. And, you know, all sorts of other uh, things have gotten so much better in this country, I think, especially in this country. Um, and, you know, that's that's part of the thing that makes it um, a challenge, right, for me, because, like, if you're looking, if you're looking, how did, goodness, how did America become the richest, most powerful country in the history of all humanity? Basically, by letting free people try shit out. Right. There's a great book by Bill Bryson uh, called America One Summer 1921, I think is the title of it. And it's so cool because when you read it, like you forget we're new, like radio was new. Lindbergh was the most popular and best known figure in human history. Right. And the guy who announced his welcoming party when he flew back and landed in the United States, I, I, Bryson points out in the book. That individual, I can't remember his name, but that individual, the radio announcer, spoke to more humans than any other human in human history. And that my parents were babies, right? And so we've compressed a lot of progress, both social progress, which I think is awesome, uh, with technological progress, but I still you know, where, where do we get the balance? How do we have, how do like, can you steel man, for example, have you steel man the case against progress? And, and what would that even look like? I'm, I'm just throwing you all these softballs. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, I've thought about this a lot. And, um, uh, I intend to, uh, have a chapter, uh, or two on this in the book that I'm working on. So I'm, I'm writing a book about progress. And there's going to be an entire chapter on is progress good? And it's going to, you know, look at, I mean, you can look at every single argument in one chapter, but we're going to try to look at a lot of the, you know, the top things. Um, Yeah, no, there are, there are, look, like I said, the problems of progress are real. Um, and so uh, we can't, uh, uh, you know, and when I say we need a new philosophy of progress for the 21st century, th I, I say that very deliberately um, because I think one of the things we can't do is go back to the sort of naive optimism of the 19th century. Um, I think we need to acknowledge, uh, you know, the problems. So, um, there are all sorts of health hazards, um, and safety, uh, you know, concerns. Uh, I mean, every, almost every technology has its own set of these. Um, there is social upheaval and technological unemployment. There is, uh, the potential for these things to be used for war and oppression. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, there uh, all, all of these are real. And um, we, you know, as we develop new technology and deploy it, I think we need to think about um, 
uh, about all of these things and think about how to how to mitigate these problems. And I think we need to think about it, you know, more in advance than we used to, right? So um, I think historically, especially if you go back to, you know, before the middle of the 20th century or so, um, a lot of progress was made on a very reactive basis. You, you build something, you put it out there, oops, then you see what went wrong. Now we can learn from failure and create, um, you know, and, 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 and put something in place, right? We build the automobile, we put it out there, oops, a lot of people are getting into crashes. Maybe we should have seatbelts in this thing, um, you know, and and ultimately maybe it should have airbags and anti-lock brakes and and all that stuff. I mean, the first you know the first cars didn't even have windshields; they didn't even have brake lights or turn signals. I mean, there was a lot of stuff, right? We did oh, we didn't we didn't have stop signs and we didn't have traffic lights and we didn't have we didn't even just, we certainly didn't have driver's licenses, right? So there's a whole lot of stuff that was missing from that beginning. And this is kind of what I was getting at earlier when I was saying like over time as we've made the world safer. People, I think, demand more safety from new technologies. And so I think there actually is a positive trend of doing more uh, safety testing on on technologies up front. Um, and I mean, I gave, so I gave autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars as an example. Um, I think a lot with, um, you know, uh, in biotech, um, certainly, you know, new treatments like genetic therapies are going to get way more testing done on them than the, f- the first pharmaceuticals did more than a century ago. Um I think, um, uh, I mean, in general, biotech is an area that I, a field that I think is very conscious of its own uh, potential to do harm and of the responsibility that it needs to take. Um, and there are examples of this throughout, um, you know, throughout the last, you know, several decades of, of kind of biotech history. Moments when people just said, whoa, this thing, uh, you know, this thing could be dangerous. Um and let's pause a moment. Let's slow down. Let's think about what you know how we how we need to uh, to deal with this. I mean, so one famous example is um, in 1975 when recombinant DNA uh, techniques were invented, and we could now do new types of genetic engineering. Um, uh, a bunch of folks got together at what is now known as the Asilomar Conference to discuss specifically, like, hey, we could engineer some like some crazy viruses or, you know, something that might escape the lab, we could actually create a a, a big problem here. What are we going to do about it? And they came up with safety standards for, you know, how to do your research and, um, uh, you know, what kind of safety equipment you needed when, what, when do you need a, uh, you know, a lab with a, um, reverse pressure so that if the door opens, the, the air blows in and not out. And when do you need to wear protective equipment and when do you need, you know, so, so on and so forth. Um, you know, more recently, um, there was a researcher at MIT, Kevin Esvelt, who created, um, the, came up with the idea of the CRISPR based gene drive. So this is using CRISPR genetic technology to, um, uh, be able to take a gene modification and actually, uh, spread it through a population much faster than, uh, you know, it would kind of naturally, um, uh, spread through any kind of evolutionary process. Um, and he came up with this idea and his, his first thought was, oh my God, you could use this to say, you know, eliminate the ability of mosquitoes to carry malaria and we could end that disease and save, you know, all sorts of lives. And then the next day he thought, whoa, wait a sec. There's a lot of other things we could do with this technology besides end malaria. And before I tell anybody about this, before I even tell my advisor about this, I should, I got to think this through. And he spent a lot of time thinking about sort of the implications of the technology, how it could be used for good or bad, whether it favor, you know, in his terms, whether it favors offense or favors defense. Um, and it, ultimately, he decided to tell the world about it and to publish it. And, you know, he decided it was better to have it out there in the world than not. But he was very careful in, in, and thoughtful in, in thinking that through. Um, so I think technologists can and should be responsible about their work in that way. Could not agree more. Um, and, uh, I think again, it's a great example of, you know, as we learn from, uh, earlier innovations that, you know, you, you mentioned the car, um, and that's a classic one because everyone knows about cars and, um, uh, how, how the path started with them being very dangerous. Um, you know, that was the red, uh, red, uh, flag idea was because briefly one of the state's 
had a thing that somebody had to walk in front of a car holding a red lamp lantern to warn all of the horses that this dangerous vehicle was coming. Um, so I, I think that we have iteratively become smarter about anticipating the secondary and tertiary uh, effects of an innovation or a technology. And I'm totally 100% in favor of that. Um, but then I worry, okay, um, you have rogue actors out there. You have rogue states out there where our good intentions really don't have any bearing. And, you know, I, I've thought about this endlessly. Like, you know, after, after the horrors of uh, chemical warfare during World War II, we effectively banned it. Right. And there were very few chemical weapons used during World War II, even though you had Adolf Hitler up there on the other side, kind of the personification of evil. How did how did that one stick and 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 uh, have compliance by some very bad actors, uh, whereas others don't? For example, how long have we had nuclear weapons and the fact the world has not been blown up is and by many, you could say that's somewhat surprising. The fact that we have these weapons of mass destruction. I, I saw a cartoon, just a brief digression, which is um, uh, AGI, which is sentient artificial intelligence, something I think is way in the future. Many people think it's now. Uh, you can have a discussion about why they think that and why I think what I think. Uh, but the little cartoon was cute. It was like... Uh, uh, it, so it shows the computer becoming sentient, the AI becoming sentient, and launching all the nuclear weapons into the sun, with with the with the with the uh, a, AI saying, "Why in God's name are you humans ha have these things?" <laughs> right? So how how do we how do we engineer it, so to speak, so that we can get widespread uh, compliance, even with bad actors out there? Yeah. That's another problem I don't have the answer to. Um, I, uh, and, you know, in, in particular, there's a, a concern that, um, you know, maybe up until now, it's mostly taken nation states to do really bad things like have nuclear weapons. Um, but uh, there's, uh, I forget where this comes from, the, you know, the notion that every some number of years, the IQ that it takes to destroy the world drops by one point. And so eventually we might have technologies in the hands of, of everyone, any individual that would be so powerful that they could, you know, destroy everything. And then it doesn't even take, um, a nation state, right? It just takes one terrorist group or one, um, uh, you know, or one lunatic. Um, I, I mean, I have only, uh, only a couple of basic things to say in response to that. I mean, one is that, um, uh, uh I think, you know, we need to develop defensive technology at the same time as we develop, you know, potentially offensive capabilities. Um, and, uh, you know, that's very specific to each potential technology, right? I mean, what, what would guard against, um, you know, a, a bioterrorism or, a, you know, an engineered or released, uh, deliberately released, released pandemic is very different from what guards against nuclear weapons or, you know, uh, and so forth. Um, but I think in each of those areas, we do need to think about, um, you know, what, what kind of defenses could we have? Um, and, and then, you know, but the other thing I'll just say is I think the fact that we haven't used nuclear weapons for about 75 years, almost 80 years, um, the fact that, um, you know, that, that some of these other, other scenarios that you can really imagine would be quite terrible have not come to pass gives me a little bit of hope that maybe there's just enough, you know, sort of humanity and decency out there that make at least wanting to destroy the world or being willing to, um, quite rare. Yeah. I think, uh, you're the, the scariest thing in your answer is something I've thought a lot about too, which is, um, I listen, I believe that AI should be ubiquitous and everywhere. Uh, because I think if we, if, if we add a digital divide to an economic divide, uh, that gets very scary very quickly. 
But I think your point is well taken um, about the ability of pushing down the IQ it takes to destroy the world. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, we have seen um, a, through some you know, just lived history that there are certain ideologies that lead to terrorism, which lead to a desire that they honestly believe that this is hell, where they are right now, Earth, and that there's this golden paradise uh, if they blow themselves up and become a martyr. Um, that makes them very willing to take down the rest of the world, too. So I, I passionately agree with your idea that we have to get good at defense as well. And, um, you know, for example, in AI, I think um, we, we need a prize for deep uh, fake detection. Um, and, you know, I'm going to put money up on one of those prizes. Hopefully stability AI will be the, uh, AI company to launch this challenge and uh, Shaughnessy ventures will match whatever they're offering because defense is something we're going to need to think a lot about. Um, and I, and, and not simply relying on the better angel of people's natures, uh, because there's a lot of people who have you know, they're death cults out there and, and they are quite willing themselves to die. Um, and they're quite willing if you give them the tools to bring all of humanity with them. Um, so thinking defensively, I think is required, uh, going forward. Uh, I just wonder though, that like even that part of this conversation, right. Um, people hear that and they're like, what? <laughs> and and then you just give them another reason to be frightened. And I think that's how you get the Panglossia and everything is uh, perfect in the best of all possible worlds on the naive optimist side, right? Uh, like, I'm incredibly optimistic, but I'm a realist. And like, if you're a realist, like you are, and that's why I think your institute is great and what you're doing is great. But, um, you know, you, you, you hesitate, right? Because... If you bring up something that's on a real problem, um, you, you, you don't want to get it to, so you scare the shit out of everyone so badly that they're like, no, shut it down, <laughs> shut everything down. I mean, uh, like, is there a, is, is there an easier path for that? Or am I over worrying the situation? <laughs> I think the most important thing to do is for the technologists themselves. I mean, the, the the scientists and the engineers and the founders of technology companies and so forth, for them to be very clear that they are taking the risks seriously, that they are, um, and, and that they have a plan. And tell people what your plan is. Um Tell people what risks you are worried about and how you're addressing them, right? And sort of build that confidence through openness. Um, but present a plan and, of, you know, here's how we're going to move forward. Um, uh, you know, and at the same time, help people see the benefits. Like, what's the upside of this, of this new thing? Um, why should we, you know, why should, why should we, why should we be excited about this at all? Like, why should we, if there are these risks, what makes it worth it? Right. And so just sort of paint that full picture. Um, but I think, I think being open about all of that, including the risks and the plan for addressing them, but making it a positive plan forward is, is the way to go. Yeah. I, I, that, that is what I concluded as well. Um, you know, and my worry of course was in this, in this era of gotcha, um, and, and arguments made not with good intentions, um, it becomes a challenge, right? Uh, and, and you just have to hope that, um, the, the, the people building these technologies, the people investing in these technologies, et cetera, have that kind of open, uh, minded approach, uh, again, sunlight is the best disinfectant, and and so I I believe we should have a wiki um, that is moderated, right? So that people can't just go on and say everyone's going to die, <laughs> and that's it. Um, but you know that that can dissolve very quickly 
if there is a, um, you know, a uh, campaign, fear, uncertainty, and doubt again, do we want to rule? We're going to sow fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And there are no, there's no um, lack of those people in the world, right? Who just want to use the, uh, you know, they just want to see everything burn. Um, and so I, I think that uh, projects like yours, like, it's why I am passionately in favor of, I think it's a great uh, project. I think it's a great institute. And I think that um, as we go forward, uh, you'll learn more and you'll get better at it and you'll draw more people to your cause. Hopefully this will draw more people to your cause. Um, and so you can 100% count on my uh, support uh, in this endeavor. At the end of each of our podcasts, we ask our uh, guest, um, we're going to make you the emperor of the world uh, for one day. Um, you can't kill anyone and you can't throw anyone in a re-education camp, but we're going to hand you a magical microphone and you're going to be able to speak two things into that microphone and you're going to incept the entire world whenever their next morning is, when they wake up, every eight, every one of the eight billion people in the world are going to think, I just had the two greatest ideas and I'm going to pursue both of them. What are you going to incept in, in all of the world's population? Mm. So my, I mean, the two basic ideas that I'm trying to get out to the world or, or two, two of them are like one progress is real and important and the progress in science, technology, uh, you know, industry and the economy of the last couple hundred years are basically one of the greatest things that's happened to humanity. Um, and we should really want to keep that going. Um, and number two, we can keep it going. We are nowhere near done. There is so much more progress to be had. And if we look back at people from a couple hundred years ago and we say, wow, they were desperately poor by the standards of today, or flipping it around, that we are, in fact, fantastically rich by the standards of that time. Well, if we think about the future, we should be able to see that we today are desperately poor compared to where things can be and should be in the future if we keep progress going. Or, again, to flip it around, put it more positively, the future can be fantastically wealthy. Everyone can be fantastically wealthy in the future, um, uh, compared to, you know, by, by the standards of today and we should be, and that's the future that we should be aiming for. So if I, if I boil those two ideas down to just two words, progress is desirable and progress is possible. I love it. So Tracy. let's go make it. Um, how, how can our listeners and viewers find you? How can they contribute to the Institute? Tell them where to find. Yeah, sure. Uh, you can find the roots of progress, uh, online at rootsofprogress.org. Um, and you can find me on Twitter. My handle is Jason Crawford. Um, those are probably the, it's probably the two best ways. Um, you can sign up for our mailing list at rootsofprogress.org. And, um, you can also find out how to contribute there. We have a Patreon. We have, uh, we take PayPal and, uh, and so forth. Fantastic. Jason, I applaud your efforts. Uh, count me as an ally, uh, and a contributor. Uh, I think it's very important what you're doing and, uh, I tip my hat to you. Uh, we need more people on our side in this. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. Enjoyed uh, being here.